The Great Gatsby, Chapter 1. In my younger and more vulnerable years, my father gave me some advice that I've been turning over in my mind ever since. Whenever you feel like criticizing anyone, he told me, just remember that all the people in this world haven't had the advantages that you've had. He didn't say any more, but we've always been unusually communicative in a reserved way. And I understood that he meant a great deal more than that. In consequence, I'm inclined to reserve all judgments, a habit that has opened up many curious natures to me and also made me the victim of not a few veteran bores. The abnormal mind is quick to detect and detach itself to this quality when it appears in a normal person. And so it came about that in college, I was unjustly accused of being a politician because I was privy to the secret griefs of wild, unknown men. Most of the confidences were unsought. Frequently I have feigned sleep, preoccupation, or a hostile levity when I realized by some unmistakable sign that an intimate revelation was quivering on the horizon. For the intimate revelations of young men, or at least the terms in which they express them, are usually plagiaristic and marred by obvious suppressions. Reserving judgments is a matter of infinite hope. I am still a little afraid of missing something if I forget that, as my father snobbishly suggested and I snobbishly repeat, a sense of the fundamental decencies is parceled out unequally at birth. And after boasting this way of my tolerance, I come to the admission that it has a limit. Conduct may be founded on the hard rock or the wet marshes, but after a certain point, I don't care what it's founded on. When I came back from the East last autumn, I felt that I wanted the world to be in uniform and at sort of a moral attention forever. I wanted no more riotous excursions with privileged glimpses into the human heart. Only Gatsby, the man who gives his name to this book, was exempt from my reaction. Gatsby, who re represented everything for which I have an unaffected scorn. If personality is an unbroken series of successful gestures, then there was something gorgeous about him, some heightened sensitivity to the promises of life. As if he were related to one of those intricate machines that register earthquakes 10,000 miles away. This responsiveness had nothing to do with that flabby impressionability, which is dignified under the name of the creative temperament. It was an extraordinary gift for hope, a romantic readiness such as I have never found in any other person and which it is not likely I shall ever find again. No, Gatsby turned out all right at the end. It is what preyed on Gatsby, what foul dust floated in the wake of his dreams that temporarily closed out my interest in the abortive sorrows and short-winded elations of men. My family have been prominent well-to-do people in this Middle Western city for three generations. The Caraways are something of a clan and we have a tradition that we're descended from the Dukes of Beklo, but the actual founder of my line was my grandfather's brother, who came here in 51, sent a substitute to the Civil War, and started the wholesale hardware business that my father carries on today. I never saw this great uncle, but I'm supposed to look like him with special reference to the rather hard-boiled painting that hangs in my father's office. I graduated from New Haven in 1915, just a quarter of a century after my father, and a little later I participated in that delay to tonic migration known as the Great War. I enjoyed the counter raid so thoroughly that I came back restless. Instead of being the warm center of the world, the Middle West now seemed like the ragged edge of the universe, so I decided to go east and learn the bond business. Everybody I knew was in the bond business, so I supposed it could support one more single man. All my aunts and uncles talked it over as if they were choosing a prep school for me and finally said, why, yes, with very grave, hesitant faces. Father agreed to finance me for a year, and after various delays, I came east permanently, I thought, in the spring of 22. The practical thing was to find rooms in the city, but it was a warm season, and I had just left a country of wide lawns and friendly trees, so when a young man at the office suggested that we take a house together in a commuting town, it sounded like a great idea. He found the house, a weather-beaten cardboard bungalow at 80 a month, but at the last minute, the firm ordered him to Washington, and I went to the country alone. I had a dog, at least I had him for a few days until he ran away, and an old Dodge and a Finnish woman who made my bed and cooked breakfast and muttered Finnish wisdom to herself over the electric stove. It was lonely for a day or so until one morning some man more recently arrived than I stopped me on the road. How do you get to West Egg Village? He asked helplessly. I told him. And as I walked on, I was lonely no longer. I was a guide, a pathfinder, an original settler. He had casually conferred on me the freedom of the neighborhood. And so with the sunshine and the great bursts of leaves growing on the trees just as things grow in fast movies, I had that familiar conviction that life was beginning over again with the summer. There was so much to read for one thing and so much fine health to be pulled down out of the young breath-giving air. I bought a dozen volumes on banking and credit and investment securities and they stood on my shelf in red and gold like new money from the mint, promising to unfold the shining secrets that only Midas and Morgan and Mackinus knew. And I had the high intention of reading many other books besides. 
I was rather literary in college. One year I wrote a series of very solemn and obvious editorials for the Yale News, and now I was going to bring back all such things into my life and become, again, that most limited of all specialists, the well-rounded man. This isn't just an epigram. Life is much more successfully looked at from a single window, after all. It was a matter of choice that I should have rented a house in one of the strangest communities in North America. It was on that slender, riotous island, which extends itself due east of New York, and where there are, among other natural curiosities, two unusual formations of land. Twenty miles from the city, a pair of enormous eggs, identical in contour and separated only by a courtesy bay, jut out into the most domesticated body of salt water in the western hemisphere, the great wet barnyard of the Long Island Sound. They are not perfect ovals like the egg in the Columbus story. They are both crushed flat at the contact end, but their physical resemblance must be a source of perpetual confusion to the gulls that fly overhead. To the wingless, a more arresting phenomenon is the dissimilarity in every particular except shape and size. I lived at West Egg, the, well, the less fashionable of the two, though this is a most superficial tag to express, the bizarre, and not a little sinister contrast between them. My house was at the very tip of the egg, only 50 yards from the sound, and squeezed between two huge places that rented for twelve or 15000 a season. The one on my right was a colossal affair by any standard. It was a factual imitation of some Hotel de Ville in Normandy, with the tower on one side spanking new under a thin beard of raw ivy and a marble swimming pool, and more than 40 acres of lawn and garden. It was Gatsby's mansion, or rather, as I didn't know Mr. Gatsby, it was a mansion inhabited by a gentleman of that name. My own house was an eyesore, but it was a small eyesore, and it had been overlooked, so I had a view of the water, a partial view of my neighbor's lawn, and the consoling proximity of millionaires, all for $80 a month. Across the Courtesy Bay, the white palaces of fashionable East A glittered along the water, and the history of the summer really begins on the evening I drove over there to have dinner with the Tom Buchanan's. Daisy was my second cousin once removed, and I'd known in Tom in college, and just after the war, I spent two days with them in Chicago. Her husband, among various physical accomplishments, had been one of the most powerful ends that ever played football at New Haven, a national figure in a way, one of those men who reach a, such an acute limited excellence at 21 that everything afterwards savors of anticlimax. His family were enormously wealthy, even in college, his freedom with money was a matter of, for reproach. But now he'd left Chicago and come east in a fashion that rather took your breath away. For instance, he'd brought down a string of polo ponies from Lake Forest. It was hard to realize that a man in my own generation was wealthy enough to do that. Why they came east, I don't know. They had spent a year in France for no particular reason and then drifted here and there and restfully wherever people play, played polo and were rich together. This was a permanent move, said Daisy over the telephone. But I didn't believe it. I had no sight into Daisy's heart. But I felt that Tom would drift on forever seeking, a little wistfully, for the dramatic turbulence of some irrecoverable football game. And so it happened that on a warm, windy evening, I drove over to East Egg to see two old friends whom I scarcely knew at all. Their house was even more elaborate than I expected. A cheerful red and white Georgian colonial mansion overlooking the bay. The lawn started at the beach and ran toward the front door for a quarter of a mile, jumping over sundials and brick walks and burning gardens, finally when it reached the house drifting up the side in bright vines as though from the momentum of its run. The front was broken by a line of French windows, glowing now with reflected gold and wide open to the warm, windy evening, and Tom Buchanan in riding clothes was standing with his legs apart on the front porch. He had changed since his New Haven years. Now he was a sturdy, straw-haired man of thirty with a rather hard mouth and a supercilious manner. Two shining, arrogant eyes had established dominance over his face and gave him the appearance of always leaning aggressively forward. Not even the effeminate swank of his riding clothes could hide the enormous power of that body. He seemed to fill those glistening boots until he strained the top lacing, and you could see a great pack of muscle shifting where his shoulder moved under his thin coat. It was a body capable of enormous leverage, a cruel body. His speaking voice, a gruff husky tenor, added to the impression of fractiousness he conveyed. There was a touch of paternal contempt in it, even toward people he liked, and there were men at New Haven who had hated his guts. Now, don't think my opinion on these matters is final, he seemed to say, just because I'm stronger and more of a man than you are. We were in the same senior society, 
And while we were never intimate, I always had the impression that he approved of me and wanted me to like him with some harsh, defiant wistfulness of his own. We talked for a few minutes on the sunny porch. I've got a nice place here, he said, his eyes flashing about restlessly. Turning me around by one arm, he moved a broad, flat hand along the front vista, including in its sweep a sunken Italian garden, a half acre of deep, pungent roses, and a snub-nosed motorboat that bumped the tide offshore. It belonged to Domain, the oil man. He turned me around again, politely and abruptly. We'll go inside. We walked through a hall, a high hallway, into a bright, rosy-colored space, gradually bound into the house by French windows at either end. The windows were ajar and gleaming white against the fresh grass outside that seemed to grow a little way into the house. A breeze blew through the room, blew curtains in at one end and out the other like pale flags, twisting them up towards the frosted wedding cake of the ceiling, and then rippled over the wine-colored rug, making a shadow on it as wind does on the sea. The only completely stationary object in the room was an enormous couch on which two young women were buoyed up as though upon an anchored balloon. They were both in white, and their dresses were rippling and fluttering as if they'd been blown back in after a short flight around the house. I must have stood for a few moments listening to the whip and snap of the curtains and the groan of a picture on the wall. Then there was a boom as Tom Buchanan shut the rear windows and caught and the caught wind died out about the room, and the curtains and the rugs and the two young women ballooned slowly to the floor. The younger of the two was a stranger to me. She was extended full length at her end of the divan, completely motionless, and with her chin raised a little as if she were balancing something on it, which was quite likely to fall. If she saw me out of the corner of her eyes, she gave no hint of it. Indeed, I am almost surprised into murmuring an apology for having disturbed her by coming in. The other girl, Daisy, made an attempt to rise. She leaned slightly forward with a conscientious expression. Then she laughed an absurd, charming little laugh, and I laughed too, and came forward into the room. I'm paralyzed with happiness. Hey, let me just say, I hope you enjoyed this reading of The Great Gatsby. We have the whole book on our playlist, so please check it out if you need previous chapters or later chapters. Uh, you can find that playlist right here. Also, we do gaming and other things. You can check out these playlists for uh, some of those interesting and maybe even a little amusing videos that we have. And above all, we would love it if you could subscribe to the channel. Help us out and have a good one. Until next time.